John, you're muted. <laughs> There's always one, right? So good morning, all. How are you today? And I want to thank all of you for joining us for measuring the distance traveled, translating learned skills. And really, today, I'm, we're, I want to apologize. We've had an um, kind of, a, as, as always happens inside the Beltway with uh, the White House and OMB and OPM, um, our, invite, uh, our guests, Kimberly Holden and Christy Daphnis, uh, started getting emails last night in the middle of uh, the docuseries uh, U.S. and the Holocaust, which touched on kind of the importance of culture and ethics and equity. And it was very deeply, almost too moving. And lo and behold, they were called away um, in large part uh, due to some issues uh, around migrant children and, and immigration issues. And it touches on kind of wh where we're going in terms of helping those underrepresented groups and looking at questions around uh, really the individual person and taking a holistic view. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited and I'm going to um, uh, just kind of be the note taker, fact checker, maybe answer some questions or field questions. So I'd like to introduce you to our speakers and um, new to the agenda um, is Mr. Reese Madsen. Reese Madsen served distinguishedly and um, for over 14 years as the chief learning officer at the Department of Defense, as well as the Office of Personnel Management. He's been a big advocate for driving a national learning agenda and certainly um, brings a unique skill uh, understanding of the skills marketplace and its importance in terms of IT modernization. And by all means, Reese, please introduce yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, I am honored to be here. Uh, one uh, major piece of that uh, resume I um, need to bring up is I was in the US Coast Guard for 24 years. And why is that important? Because the military and within the Department of Defense, and as you'll hear from Heath, within law enforcement, you have two major federal workforce segments who have a culture of, of learning. And to get promoted, you have to learn. And to uh, continue in the uh, profession, yeah, keep learning. And so within the, the military and law enforcement, um, that is a culture that is not unfortunately shared by all the federal government uh, entities. But you can see from our history that um, we get it, we've seen it, it works. And we want to be able to share those experiences with you so that we can have it work elsewhere as well. So at DOD, um, so at, within the Coast Guard, I was the uh, workforce manager looking at all aspects of HR and development. And then I moved over to DOD to become the chief learning officer of the Title 10 programs, which are the Intel, security, and law enforcement um, portfolios of the um, department. So. That included a uh, degree granting uh, academic institution, as well as training centers, uh, experiential programs. So we had a great mix of training, education, and experience as the skills developing apparatus for two and a half million national security professionals. And I think that is a, a unique experience, especially for this topic. Excellent. Keith. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think most people are probably on from the East Coast. Um, Heath Anderson, I'm uh, the CEO of uh, Realm Advisors and IT and CIO Advisory um, Services Organization. And um, previous to that, I was the uh, chairperson of the legislative branch uh, CIO Council. Um, as well as uh, holding the role of CIO at the U.S. Capitol Police. And for a couple of the years while at Capitol Police, I was also the uh, Chief Human Capital Officer um, in a dual-hatted uh, role there. I've supported primarily law enforcement organizations 
across the legislative branch, DOJ, DHS, um, during my career. Started off as a uh, law enforcement officer in the uh, Coast Guard, matter of fact, uh, and then uh, transitioned to local PD um, in Virginia. And so I've been supporting that space for uh, well over 20 years at this point. Um, I'm looking forward to, to the discussion today. We'll try and fill in some, uh, some gaps for the folks that weren't able to be here with us uh, this morning. And um, yeah, I, I think that's enough about me. We'll go ahead and turn it back over to John. Thank you, Heath. And of course, our chief technology officer at Astromu and um, somebody who is just wonderful and, and is going to bring some really great discussion to, to the table today. I'd like to introduce Kai Peterson to give you his his experience and background and just kind of let, let, him, let, let him tell you a little bit about who he is. And I'll, I'll just add though, he also likes hiking, uh, extreme mountain hiking or mountain climbing. So um, I'm glad we could, we, we see him, we have him with us today. Thanks for joining us, Kai. Thank you very much, John. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and looking forward to the conversation. I mean, very briefly, my, my career has spanned more than 20 years in venture creation, particularly where it's uh, been involved in terms of fintech, medtech, edtech, search, investment management sectors, all sectors that are very uh, closely aligned with data, large scale data, real time data. And so over, over my career, I've been fortunate enough to be involved with companies like uh, Pharmacy One Source, which was acquired by Walters Claw. We had a cloud based software solution that allowed us to uh, alert clinicians um, in 30% of the US hospitals uh, around adverse drug events and other clinical conditions within uh, you know, three seconds. And so that's kind of a massive scale rules engine that we pulled together. Also had the pleasure of working as the CTO for Bill Gates Investments. Um, and uh, prior to that, I was the VP of engineering at quote.com. Uh, which was taken over by Lycos. Back in the day, it was the number one search engine, but obviously history has put that to, put that to bed. And uh, in that time, I was able to grow uh, the business by 20x in three years uh, and uh, use that to also make it the second most profitable unit after search at Lycos. Um, so and as you can see, I've, I've, I've had a, a fun journey and uh, continue to enjoy it with Astromu. Excellent. Well, let's let's just jump right in. I, I, and I, I'd like to kind of um, really kind of ask that first question. And, and I know, Kai, we talked about this and, you know, maybe well, why do you feel it's hard for the government to, to find and retain talent these days? I mean, there's there's a lot uh, out there around this. And I kind of to put that within context as, as we kind of start down this uh, to explore how we can translate those skills from learning and working experience and moving to a skills-based approach to recruiting as well as retention. That's a good question. I, you know, the, obvi the obvious um, challenge, uh, which uh, I think most people understand is, is, is the constraints around access to data um, and uh, what it takes to secure that access uh, and for a lot of companies who I think are involved in um, some of the more innovative spaces, it's, it's a big hurdle to overcome. Uh, a good example of that is, you know, uh, Astromu, we're SOC 2 compliant, but really to work with a number of the federal agencies, we're going to probably need to secure FedRAMP uh, authorization to secure data. And it's the data that will help us get a better understanding across uh, the, the, the federal agencies and others to see where the skills lie and what skills are actually required. I also think there is um, one of the, the challenges is how do you articulate the mission uh, working within the government in a way that attracts talent uh, and, and helps talent understand why they can have an impact and why it's valuable. And some of that gets lost in translation because you really don't have insights in terms of what, what advancement looks like uh, within uh, the, the government and how you secure that advancement and what kind of skills you need. And, and then I think there's also natural barriers uh, around how the job descriptions are constructed in such a way that uh, you know, there are minimum requirements that you've got to ask yourself realistically, are they necessary? Uh, particularly when you have uh, 55 million people who are essentially not degreed, but clearly have skills, how do you break down some of those in, 
and those barriers so you can access that talent pool in a way to excite and, and, and bring value into the, uh, the government from a different non-traditional source of talent. I mean, we heard in the last administration, there was, seemed to be a real emphasis to hire like industry. Um, and with IT modernization and the needs around, for instance, just software development. I mean, I, I know that like 64% of, of software developers don't have a bachelor's requirement. So we've, you know, that kind of leads me to that next question. And again, I want to open that up to um, within the lenses. How, how's that policy going to shape itself around those barriers to entry? And and what really needs to happen in, in your opinion? And uh, please, um, Reese or or Heath, feel free to to chime in and and uh, would also love to hear if there may be some other key barriers around recruiting and retention you feel are important to note. So some of these issues I I've seen for a long, long time. And the the challenges aren't technical nor fiscal but they are cultural and political, where, uh, especially from the last question to this, it's a matter of what do I feel more comfortable with? Obviously the last administration was very comfortable with industry, so they understood how industry works, they understand how um, people get developed, they understand how the, the training pipeline works. And as, as Heath can, demonstrate the law enforcement people understand law enforcement folks they understand how the the cops are developed they understand how military police are developed they understand um the the world of law enforcement and in my world it's the the military and the department of defense so we understand what we know but that doesn't really uh, help when somebody is sending a resume, which may have every skill that I need. I just don't know it. I don't know what I don't know. If they didn't put it into a military ease or um, they had experiences that I could understand or had exposure to, then I may not be able to uh, comprehend or give them full um, credit for the skills that they actually have. And I think that kind of goes to what's the underlying theme here is that if, you know, educational degrees are nice, simple, easily to understand and time honored uh, qualifications. But as we know, especially now, people don't go to uh, get degrees as much anymore. One, because they're expensive. Uh, two, they're starting to find, figure out that going to get a degree may or may not have the same payoff as it, it once did. And so uh, I think the key here is trying to get to the, the root of the problem and to get that solution that truly understands everyone's capability and the skills that they bring to the table and more importantly, what skills they don't bring to the table and which ones can be um, developed later or the things that are, are showstoppers. So I think that's that's key. And the policy just doesn't exist to, to do that right now. We have the technology. We, have, we can get down to the competency and proficiency level in understanding skills and um, readiness type issues. But we have chosen not to apply that either because we don't know about it or they don't see the the technology that can do it for them so so very relevant given the back and forth on schedule f we're hearing i i can't help but think and and, and heath I'd, I'd love it if you could weigh in because the the big question i would have and thank you for pointing out reese it's it's culture and it's you know that that opens up a little bit of bias and um but also you know i'm i'm wondering if self reporting occupational uh questions could, could lend themselves to being perhaps discriminatory in that hiring process yeah i can i can jump in a little bit here i mean i think um 
you know, some, some great points have been, been made, you know, I'll go back to kind of the, the, the general answer with, with most things in, in the federal government is, you know, we've, we've got a compounded set of problems that span across people process and technology here. Right. So um, current, current administration has made some, uh, some pretty good headway. Um, you know, I think with, with some of the policy and guidance that has been recently issued to um, uh, kind of further support modernizing and reforming the assessment and hiring um, processes for federal employment. Um, you know, I know that they've recently uh, released an updated uh, general schedule, um, QALS operating manual, as well as some FAQs associated to those these are documents that I think are going to be helpful for anybody related um, or involved in um, kind of that, that um, hiring um, process or talent acquisition process um, in the federal government, um, where I think we'll probably dive into a little bit deeper in the, the discussion where, where I see technology can play a, a pretty substantial um, role in assisting um, not just the technology side, but also the people side in freeing up resources that are otherwise overly burdened um, within the HR offices or the hiring manager offices um, doing tedious time consuming kind of administrative tasks versus you know value add to the hiring life cycle, right? So, I know we're going to touch on, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning and how some of that can kind of, you know, inject a, um, a bit of additional horsepower into, into this um, kind of this set of challenges. And I, I think it is key because the use of these technologies um, it can do a lot for, um, you know, this, this area in particular uh, throughout the entire life cycle of talent acquisition and management all the way to, you know, onboarding and, and beyond. Um, so it is worth the, the look to um, really um, explore what technologies might be available so that we can uh, inject that, um, uh, those benefits directly into this and really drive business value and, and quality of, of hiring and the candidates that we uh, were able to bring uh, into the federal service. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to talk a little bit more as we get deeper into the, uh, the technology side, but obviously there's a lot on the people side uh, where people are just overburdened um, in, in, this, um, in this set of processes. And that creates a number of roadblocks um, or significant delays that, that are otherwise, you know, causing uh, the candidate experience to be very poor. Um, so in comparison to private sector where you have an, you know, an expeditious, you know, um, sourcing and talent acquisition process, it, you're seeing quite the opposite in many cases with the federal government. So, uh, you know, I think we have a lot of opportunity here to kind of further develop on top of the policy that's been issued recently. Yeah. And, and I know you've been a big proponent of kind of focusing further left of the cycle in terms of trade schools, high schools, obviously in law enforcement and protective services and across those mission critical occupations. I guess my, my you know, that opens the discussion. I'd love to, to Kai, because I'd love to ask Kai, hey, you know, how do we organize the data around the soft skills versus the hard skills? And, you know, what are some of those tactics or strategies for, for advocating to, to get better data sense or get better sense of data outside of digital literacy and, and what we're, we're dealing with? Well, you know, when you, when you listen to what Reese and Heath have, have, have articulated, you realize that there's an extraordinary opportunity for innovation for the government. Uh, and, and one that actually ties into the narrative that I think, you know, all sides are, are supportive of, which is how do we enable uh, individuals uh, to be uh, successfully selected and, and ultimately given a career uh, within a federal agency. And, and, and so part of that is operating with data at scale. But I think as, as, as has been touched on earlier, there is this sort of cultural aspect to it and working with um, people inside government to identify what are the soft skills that make somebody successful. Because I think at the end of the day, soft skills are really the driver for uh, people in their careers. You can learn the hard skills. You can be trained with the hard skills. And one of the great opportunities of getting a, a career in, in government, I think, is that 
there are training programs available to you once you're in and you can be developed and you can grow, but it comes with understanding how to work within some of the machinations that exist within bigger bureaucracies. And, and, and you know, just the challenge of getting hired into a government role shows you how the natural inertia within a bureaucracy works, right? It's a checklist. And so they're gonna say, well, do you have a degree? Because if you have a degree, it's easy for me to move you on to the next stage. Um, uh, how do you fit in with some of the soft skills? And so what we can do with AI is we can identify and break down those attributes uh, in a way that we can help, well, one, uh, maybe you don't actually need a degree. Maybe there are some hard skills that this person's acquired, say it's a veteran, uh, in their role as a veteran. And those hard skills coupled with the soft skills that they can demonstrate, and, and, and we've already done this with JMCI where we've broken down uh, JSTs and uh, MOSs, uh, which are sort of examples of verified experiences that those people have had, we can bring that in, normalize it, and then actually use it as a way of identifying and surfacing skills, both hard and soft, to create that competency model that we would then take the uh, information and say, well, what does the role look like? And then how do these skills map to that? And so we can say, what skills you have now? Here's the gap. This is how you can bridge it. And, mm -hmm. and in bridging it, you may not need to have to go get a degree. You may just actually need a credential. And we can give that pathway to the individual so that, that it becomes a recommendation for their advancement into the role. The other good thing about it is for the overworked HR group who, you know, they're often the ones that are the gatekeepers, suddenly they're getting people who are more relevant to the role surface. So they don't have to go through thousands of resumes to figure out who's there. They can actually say, oh, here's the group that have come through that map both the soft and hard skills for this role. Let's bring them in, and, and then you could start to see some acceleration around that. But what it does require is an open mind to innovating. It does require being, uh, you know, uh, kind of involved in a way that allows you to think about uh, opportunities for hiring, not just in terms of the traditional degree approach, but also in non-traditional ways. Can you create an apprenticeship scheme? Can you bring somebody in and allow them to develop credentials that get them to the degree and invest them in them in that way? Now, if you do that, guess what? You've suddenly become extraordinarily attractive to people who are in the non-traditional world wanting to get a role that they can use further down the road if they so choose. And it also gives you a competitive differentiation with, say, the private sector. No, I, excellent point. And I, I know. I would, yeah. No, please. Yeah. Please. I, I, I just had one thing to, to add to that. And, you know, if we step back a little bit, I have absolutely no confidence that we have good, valid data anywhere within the, the federal government because we have no data standards and we have no um, quality control of that, that data. And so I think that is the, the fatal flaw that we, we need to acknowledge at a minimum. But to, to Kai's point, we really, that is the first major first step, taking these skills and deconstructing them down to the competency and proficiency level where we can all understand that skill, or we have a defined lexicon that says when we say analysis we mean this and that's key because even if we have data across good data across the federal government if we don't have it normalized to the degree that kai was talking about then it it really doesn't matter because it's hard to then uh, extrapolate as much as we can and, and, and AI can go so far, but if we had some of these standards or at least a good baseline, then AI could take you even further, farther, faster to getting the right person in the right job. And there's no reason why a lot of this can't be done in the, not just the academic world, but down into the scholastic world. As soon as you have your first major competency or proficiency or writing or experience, that should start to develop your professional DNA of 
the capability that you are currently possessing. And of course, some of these skills need to be updated and refreshed, but um, we got to get started. We can't measure it. And if we can't measure it, we can't map it and we can't make those recommendations. And I kind of wonder why, why not use the OPM director's authorities to just kind of change the qual standards and maybe allow stackable education. And I think, you know, I'd be curious in terms of, you know, some of those considerations, how we can upskill or reskill uh, building those qualifications. I know the CFO council was looking at creating really and driving digital literacy uh, training content through an e-commerce platform, and that's coming up, um, certainly with OPM's efforts around USA Learning. I I'm curious, Heath, within your own organization, I know you transformed the U.S. Capitol Police in terms of IT modernization and kind of began in learning and started looking at recruiting. I mean, that, that culture change in those standards you're in a unique role in law enforcement. I was just curious, what was that North Star for you in terms of looking at that source of truth or, or working through the, the culture, the policies, and, and certainly the, the business workflow? Yeah, so, uh, well, in law enforcement, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of uh, competition in, in hiring and recruiting for, for law enforcement officers. So kind of had to start from the point you're already – kind of behind, right? So regardless of when you kind of got into, into the process of looking at that hiring process and, and sourcing talent, um, you know, some of the key pieces that we looked at obviously were um, kind of adjustments to current policy um, and, you know, establishing new partnerships and, and looking at additional sources of talent. Um, so you'd mentioned kind of, I'd brought this up previously, is really shifting that focus left um, and, and really trying to drive uh, further or deeper into kind of where the talent pipeline uh, can begin, whether it's high school, it's trade schools, uh, it's community colleges, um, you know, those, those areas that are not typically looked at as, you know, larger, um, uh, you know, candidate pools, um, we had to change policy around, you know, degree requirements and, and things like that to really look at, you know, um, skill mapping and the ability to um, uh, move into a role like a police officer um, based on kind of those, those competencies and the ability to learn or upskill and grow throughout, um, you know, your career. Um, so I think there were a lot of changes there. Obviously, technology played a large role in it. Um, you know, when you begin to expand the pool and you begin to send your recruiting arm out to um, different areas and begin to have different types of conversations, you also have to upskill and train kind of your recruiting um, staff, right? So we had a, a, a fairly substantial uh, process that was done in-house to kind of refocus, re-engineer that entire arm going from a traditional, more paper-based assessment and based on, you know, degrees to something that was much more fluid, still within a, a set of constructs, but allowed the ability to assess things differently. Um, so the leveraging of, of technology based on updated policy and the upskilling of our, our uh, recruitment arm was critical in our success and our, our, our ability to um, perform various surge hiring uh, that we had to do. Um, and primarily, we, we had a major surge hiring effect after January 6th and the events that surrounded uh, the U.S. Capitol. Um, so that's an ongoing process. It's continuing to, um, to, to move forward in that way. You know, another thing that I would add into that when we talk about skill mapping is really looking at, you know, the, the concept of um, skill adjacency. And it, so it's an inference of, of skills and the potential to learn a skill. And so I think this is an area where AI and machine learning can really kind of inject uh, a tremendous amount of value into a place that, uh, or a portion of the life cycle that can otherwise be skipped if you're just reading a piece of paper or you're just, you know, taking a look at an online resume. So 
that's kind of what we did. Uh, it's continuing to develop with the um, uh, with the current CIO and, um, and and HR organization since I've left. Um, but really, it kind of included all, all three aspects of that people policy and uh, and technology front. Right. And, you, you know, I know I know that, Reese, you've done some work around you'd shared with us uh, some some data sets that like cool and mosaic. And your work there around a skills strategy, I was surprised in in my previous role to hear of so few organizations that are actually doing the skills mapping yet. But there seems to be an extremely high level of interest in in really developing those skill strategies. In a recent call with the Shared Services Leadership Coalition, one of the big questions in the ten it was glaringly different between commercial and federal. To me, was you know. When were how recently have those competencies or skill sets been updated and 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 where do we go for that data? Well, and and that's a great question because if you really peel back the the onion on this and you realize that the framework that OPM is using is basically post World War II structure that really hasn't been holistically reviewed to be redone because there's a lot of those occupations that just no longer exist. And until you have some sort of functional group like the CIOs, the CFOs, acquisition, who realize that they have to do better or Congress tells them they need to do better, then they take this job on to look at the profession, look at their skills, look at the shelf life of each of these skills. And then they, they start to, to map it out. And so uh, I was able to help some of the uh, acquisition folks in DOD uh, who were tagged to lead the acquisition charge in a similar fashion to say, hey, what do we need to do? Um, these are like law enforcement, like cyber, like um, military. These are high visibility, high risk, uh, high stakes skills that in many times have zero opportunity for failure. Because if you do, then the, the net goes down. If you do, you lose millions of dollars of uh, acquisition or you lose time. And so you have to have that, um, uh, that validation that these skills are valid, they're up to date and they're, they're good to go. Um, a lot of folks have not taken the time or the effort to, to try and do that. And that's where um, I think we need to move in and AI can help be that um, catalyst to help some of these areas move further, farther, faster, um, or help provide some sort of input of how often does you know technology change? We have Moore's law, but is that still valid today? Can we, or should we, or must we, change our skills or review our skills more frequently to ensure that they are refreshed? Um, are they uh, still valid? And how are they being applied? Uh, we still have in DOD, much to my chagrin, you know, Morris Alpha operators. Well, Morris Alpha hasn't really been used in quite some time, but it's still out there and it's still being used. So we still got to train it. So um, unfortunately that has to compete with cyber issues and with other communication um, technologies. And, you know, that's just an example that technology has gone way beyond it. And unfortunately somebody out there is still using it. So we still have to train to it, but we would probably get a bigger bang for the buck if we moved towards closer towards the cyber side of communications and not the dits and daws of more yeah. self. And, and I'd be curious, Kai, because I know, I know you've done a lot of work. I mean, we're hearing a lot in the Beltway, obviously, around consortium and the power in DOD, I think, issued $20 billion in terms of OT, other than full and open competitions around around through consortiums and with that i think it's interesting because you know your your you know gao put out a report to maybe pay one percent maybe 20 percent, but the benefits are clearly innovation collaboration certainly widening the industrial supplier base in this country 
But then when now, as we look through the executive orders and looking through that lens of equity, you know, I, I, I think, um, Kai, you touched on how we can kind of look to normalize the data sets, how we might, you know, enable or map those differences between the hard skills and the soft skills. How do we enable the recommendation engine or maybe find, as, as Heath had talked about, those talent adjacencies um, and create those pathways to break through these silos to standardize some of these, these newer assessments, these tools like, ha you know, hackathons and challenges and demonstrating capability and skill? You know, it's interesting because so I'm, I'm, obviously I was educated in Europe and, and I'm part of professional associations in Europe and, and one that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a chartered uh, engineer. I'm also a chartered member of the British Computer Society. What's interesting about that is they, they both got royal charters. And what that means is that they have a responsibility for helping individuals through uh, sort of pursue their career, professionally develop it. And, and verify that that individual is continually improving and continually changing to where the market is. And they have competency frameworks that they update on a regular basis. And, and so it shows that there is power in those kinds of partnerships to affect change uh, in a loosely coupled consortium where there is there's the incentive for the private sector to do it because that professional status allows you to demonstrate to an employer you have the skills, that you continually improve on those skills. Uh, and, and it creates a model, standardized model that can be then applied across institutions, whether that's government or private enterprise. So I think we need to do something similar in the US. And Reese is right, look, data is dirty. It, it's a simple fact, data is dirty. And so if you're gonna go down a path, you have to, and I think Heath has done this, you have to sort of define a use case and you have to, and it's gonna be a simple use case that can demonstrate how success is gained by capturing data, by cleaning the data and by working with it to deliver the outcomes that I think everyone's looking to secure in terms of uh, retention, in terms of hiring, et cetera. And what's good about that is, is when you have success, there's nothing that, that in, in, the, uh, in, in the US culture, which I love more than anything else in the world, success begets success. Change happens very quickly when people see it. And, and I think this is where we need to begin. We just need to start with a simple use case, show how we can say, take one population, non-traditional population, model them, so build profiles around the skills that they have, even though the data may not be clean, we can at least see what the gap is in that data and seek improvement. So there's a quality process that goes on there. And then once you've got a very good view of the profile, the great thing about that is you're not looking at somebody's resume. You're not looking at, you know, it's, it's invisible to you. What you're getting surfaced is an individual with a set of skills that you've been able to uh, attribute value to in terms of their longitudinal journey. And, uh, it, uh, and you can then also say, well, here, here's the group of individuals that kind of, you can infer uh, that have uh, that are able to meet the re the requirements of the role, and you can also infer from that, by the way, soft skills because you can look at somebody's longitudinal journey and you can see uh, whether it's through career advancement into, say, a management role, and that there are certain skills that have been driven to meet that advancement. That gives you a sense of can they communicate, can they collaborate, can they demonstrate leadership skills, and and you don't have to. I think over-engineer this, you just have to show that the inference is valuable enough that you can find the right talent and surface them. And you have to build it around a set of standards and, and then use, that, uh, use the AI, the technology itself to continually learn and retrain so that those standards remain relevant and benefit from the improvements in the quality of the data. And, and you know, every change project I've been involved in, I've always remembered that all the people will tell me why it won't work at the beginning of the process. And then when it starts to show success, those very same people come back to you and say, wasn't it a great idea we had? And at that point, as a change owner, you say, yes, you're right. It was a great idea you had. And it becomes part of the ongoing success and people buy into it. And then you see the improvements accelerate, but you have to start somewhere. And, and that's why I think it's a wonderful opportunity for innovation within the government, because the data is there. It may be disparate. It may be dirty. But using technologies like uh, Astra Muse platform, we can ingest that, whether it's structured, semi-structured or unstructured, clean it up, structure it in a way that helps us then build uh, models and, and understanding around that data set to deliver value. 
no, and it's 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 a, a, a excellent points, and I I think in terms of there, I think there is hope. I mean, I, I see that OMB has launched a new public listening session on federal race and ethnicity standards, and they're revising that. They're also looking to set up a new hiring assessment line of businesses as part of that IT modernization push. And so, you know, I'm very interested in how you know with federal data strategy, and now with a CDO council. You know, uh, how can we then leverage those separate data sets, but cut across maybe not just federal, but take a whole of government approach that even cuts across sectors, uh, state and local. Uh, we're, we're starting to see some of those things around the, you know, uh, just for being at midweek this last week. I mean, we're talking about um, the infrastructure spending and what that means as we move forward in regards to uh, access to equity and, and driving those equitable outcomes. I, I'd be really curious if if there are, you know, from, from any of you in terms of some of those things that you think are very good, should be very top of mind as, as agencies are looking now to kind of allocate um, towards internal management processes, toward IT modernization, where we can kind of fall in line around a national learning agenda or in line with the presidential GIPRA, I forgive the acronym, uh, but but the performance, uh, but performance management as well. Yeah, I think there's there's a couple of areas. I mean, internal to the organization, I mean, you know, Kai mentioned you you you've got to get to start small and be willing to to put your foot in, right? Um, so when we're talking about skill mapping, right? Let's let's not try and boil the ocean here. Let's let's dissect this and and pick a select few. Um, you know, begin to to sketch out that that use case that you can you can get. You you need wins to get get further down that that pipeline. Um, you know, organizationally, I, I think we need to see leadership across the the CXO community, um, uh, you know, kind of stepping into the role more as, um, you know, focused on business outcomes generally, instead of just their particular area of expertise. Um, you know, I think the taking a, a holistic approach in uh, having a vested interest um, in the organization, its, its mission and goals, at which absolutely is built, um, you know, foundationally on our people, um, is critical and and having that ownership, I think, at, at every level in the organization is key. I think one of the things that I would like to see more broadly, government wide, is is deeper integration and coordination among the different CXO councils. Right. So we talk about the learning agenda, um, but having working groups that are focused on bringing in the uh, human capital side and the HR or, or the IT side, as well as the learning, then we can begin to look at data and, and it's, you know, um, you know, it's effect across the entire life cycle, right? How technology can play a role, how clean data um, and data standards uh, can play a role. And then also, you know, its effects on that workforce kind of, um, you know, uh, HR, side of of the entire life cycle of, of looking at uh you know talent acquisition um and as it moves down that life cycle over to the learning and training development all right so i think that coordination among the groups is is necessary um it's great that they're all putting out individual you know pieces of work but i think the integration and, and collaboration among the groups is is going to be critical yeah, and I, I believe that actually OMB is pushing to codify now those the, those councils and to give them a little bit more authority to work as well. You know, I, I think of uh, consortiums like CBOT, the Council Exchange Board of Trade, or if I'm if we're looking at, you know, um, some of uh, some of the efforts that are coming out of EEOC around artificial intelligence and and algorithmic fail uh, fairness with the higher initiative. I think I think we're getting to that convergence point and i think we need to get what's it going to take to get out of our own way sometimes i know attitude but we've always done it that way and i i'd be curious uh, any any thoughts on that reese i know you've been an agent of change and and uh look at culture as, as a a key determiner uh determination point there right absolutely and you know kai has hit the nail on the head you you find a, a willing participant who gets it, who wants it, 
and then you start with them and build out to include everyone that Heath has talked about. You, you have to have the Chicos involved, the CLOs involved, the, the technology officers, the CIOs, the, the CEOs, anyone in that C-suite has got to be part of it and wanting this because then they, A, see themselves in it as it develops, but um, B, is going to help implement it and then C, help to market it after uh, all is said and done. And so uh, we actually did this very successfully uh, in our security world where uh, we needed to, to move off the dime after 9-11 to improve our, our security practices. So they were um, ready, willing, and able. They said, tell us what you want us to do and, and we'll do it because in this world, uh, you don't know what you don't know. And so having somebody like uh, you guys or anyone who understands what needs to be done as it relates to both technology and the use of AI and data and all these moving parts can approach them and say, well, if we do this right, as the CEO, these are the decisions and the quality of data that you can put behind them to make these uh, data-based uh, decisions. The Chicos, this is the type of um, judgments or of uh, recommendations or priorities that you can use when we do this correctly to allow you to make um, promotions or payments or awards or selections uh, based on this data. And you just kind of go through that litany of, of folks to say, all right, this is what we're going to do. Uh, we actually did it. It took a while but we developed the first federal government uh, nationally accredited certification program. And so now uh, all the security folks in federal government who frankly use the DOD standard uh, have a certification to use and they now have a profession that, that we kind of talked about the quality control, the refreshing of, of skills, uh, and that's important because now they're, they're bonded together. They're bonded by standards. They're bonded by policy. They're bonded by a shared experience having taken these certifications. And they're now, I think, up to about 12 or 13 of them to cover the gamut of security roles in the federal government. No, and, and you're right. I mean, the 2018 Evidence Act is that policy that gives us hope. And I think, you know, I think Market Connections did a wonderful study recently on emerging technology use. And they, I think they cited something like 46% were either poor or below average in their analytics capabilities. So I think it's, it's really, you know, that notion of being a lifelong learner and continuous learning, but then aligning to you know, how can we then leverage this technology? And Kai, I'd be real curious, given your background in the space, you know, there's a lot of talk about how can we make it easier for the real innovators, the emerging technology and these solutions to do business with government, to, to, to build and support that like 2018 Evidence Act around, you know, desired outcomes in terms of ensuring equitable outcomes. You know, I think uh, Reese is right as well. You've got to start small, right? And uh, if you want to create an innovation, uh, a, a space around innovation, uh, I would uh, argue for, well, why don't you create uh, a series of um, uh, small opportunities uh, that are funded that enable a large number of smaller companies to get involved? Because that's, to be honest with you, that's where the innovation happens. The people get involved in startups like myself and others, because we see an upside uh, against the risk that we're taking to solve a hard problem. And there's tremendous upside in pursuing this. Uh, and, 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 and if you do take a, you know, essentially rather than boiling the ocean, you take a saucepan approach to it and you start to boil that up, uh, you're gonna have success. And then because you're spreading the love uh, across a number of startups, you can see where the innovation opportunities happen. And it's then it becomes easier, right? You kind of prototype, you then get to a place where you start to uh, build out the MVP and then you commercialize it. And that's where the government can get in. They can start with small amounts of money in that prototyping phase. They can then expand it for the winners that demonstrate that there's value around the prototype so that you can build uh, an MVP where you get customer engagement, in this case, government engagement, 
so they can then see improvements and continual improvements. And then there's a point where they're going to say, okay, this looks like a winner. Let's scale it. And that's where you get into that operationalization, commercialization stage. So the great thing about that is, one, the government's not risking all of its money. It's taking small, clever bets. It's then investing in the winners. And when it realizes that it has a successful uh, opportunity to take advantage of an innovation like AI to support uh, an understanding of how to retain or hire talent, then it can scale it up quickly. And that's the one thing that the government does understand. It knows how to operate at scale. And that's where they can then come in and invest in the, uh, in the solution in a way that allows it to scale rapidly across an agency and then multiple agencies. Uh, mm -hmm. Because they'll then help, they'll, they'll then understand how to define the standards, how to uh, organize the, um, the capability within their uh, agency to support the successful outcome. And they will have evidence that the outcome can be successful because of the earlier investments in those initial stages. That's what I would do if I was looking at it as a way of innovating uh, 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 across the government um, and, and stop thinking about, uh, you know, uh, 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 to Heath's earlier point, stop thinking about boiling the ocean here. You're not going to succeed with that strategy. Right. And well, and that's very topical because many on the call today are very focused in terms of what's called the HR Quizmo coming out of OPM and the Quality Services Management Office. And in, in some of the discussions at the Shared Services Leadership Coalition with SEA and NAPA, I mean, it's amazing to hear, you know, um, and I think they're, res they're, they're looking for, you know, obviously to scale success and to emulate those standards and clean the data. But I mean, when we when we think of it, I think, I think if I'm not mistaken, um, I, I had heard a rumor, and I, I'll, I'll let Reese maybe talk about that, but we're actually opening up the lens now from talent management to talent development on the heels of a report last May from DDB on, on the fact that talent data needs to be a strategic asset. And I think DOD has been doing it well or better than, you know, in terms of innovating, in terms of creating. We have Fed Supernova next week that we'll be going to um, with innovators in the DOD that are looking at OTA and those things. So as we're kind of wrapping up, I mean, I've just I know any closing thoughts or comments for folks to take away, because I know we're going to be continuing this discussion. And I'd love to hear just Heath and maybe to start for us here and inject his thoughts as well. Yeah, thanks. Um... A great discussion. Um, you know, a lot of good points. Obviously, this discussion could continue for, for quite a long time. You know, I think that there's a lot of valuable information that's been recently published. I would, I would you know, um, encourage folks that are in, involved in, in the process of, of hiring and, and talent acquisition to take a look at, um, you know, OMB and OPM uh, policy and guidance that has, has been issued. Um, you know, but also take a look at at some of um, you know the other the other documents and guidance that that might be out there around this topic. You know, uh, one in particular that kind of resonates uh, the National Skills Coalition is is an area that that folks can take a look at um, that really talks about you know um, you know a number of areas uh, racial equity and inclusion you know around the hiring process and how we we. Um, uh, dig deeper by leveraging the data and um, and and really drive you know further to the left in in that talent pipeline, um, you know and and I would just close with you know this is a holistic uh, set of problems you know people process technology um, stop trying to take on everything at one time and focus on key priorities for your organization so that you can get those early wins and. Um, and continue to build on success. Um, you know, you can tweak things as you implement um, and improve upon those. But I think the early wins are critical, especially for federal organizations. Great, Reese. I knew you had uh, absolutely, yeah. So this is the the time is now, and we've been talking about this for a long time. And Astromu and and others have the the wherewithal to to make this happen. And my, my charge to you is this, we've talked mostly about the back end of uh, the use of AI for organization, 
but this is really a trifecta problem where not only do you want to deal with the the skills people bring but you need to use that same algorithm um, to address the development of the job announcements and the uh uh, all the HR pieces so that they are complementary uh, at a minimum. But if you do this right, you're going to get secondary and tertiary um, orders of effects, where then you can go to the director of this organization and tell them that they have, you know, too much of one thing or too much of a skill or they're, they're training too much or they're not training enough or these positions or skills aren't necessary for your mission. And I think that would be hugely beneficial. Kai, any last minute thoughts before we open for questions? Yeah, certainly. I think uh, one of the great things about the US is it's an extraordinarily diverse country. Um, and that diversity is a rich talent pool for advancing our capabilities on a global scale. And we miss that uh, time and time again. And, and when we don't target that um, untapped talent pool, the 55 million people who don't have credentials uh, or degrees or halfway through their degrees, we are missing an opportunity to really accelerate innovation, accelerate value and create an economy that actually grows for everybody and allows that diversity and equity to emerge across the economy. And, you know, I can't stress that more importantly, it's a huge, huge opportunity for America to ultimately redefine itself in a global stage around competency and take advantage of the natural talent that exists within the country, because we know and we've seen it, we've moved well past the traditional industrial revolution, we are now in the knowledge revolution, and the knowledge revolution is about tapping into your people and enabling them. And if you can do that in a way that demonstrates dignity and respect through your AI, uh, I think it would open up another acceleration uh, for the economic prowess within the US and beyond. And so that's what's exciting about this. And we don't need to start large. We can actually demonstrate it with small wins and then build on our learnings and our improvements and do that in a continuous way for success. Fantastic. And I, I would only add, I wanna thank all of you for unlocking America's potential, your dedication and your passion to these topics. And with that, oh, happy to open up to any questions in the chat. I know we're we're just coming up on time, but this has been a fascinating discussion. We're gonna continue this on November 7th with Keith Sunderland, EEOC commissioner, um, who's running the AI initiative. We'll be talking to Angie Bailey from the Department of Homeland Security about some of the transformation efforts they've undergone. We'll also be hearing from the US Space Command and others. So, so I, 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 we encourage your questions and we definitely will stay on the line if, if anybody, if there's any questions in chat, don't hesitate to ask. We're excited to, to have had this time with you today. Okay. Well, I think we can go ahead and close and I wish you all a wonderful remainder to your week. Have a fantastic weekend.